What I will be talking about uh, are some advances in digital radiography, uh, particularly in medical imaging. And uh, I want this to be an interactive talk, so please feel free uh, to ask questions and don't wait till the very end because I'm going to cover a lot of material and uh, I mean I don't expect all the material to be tractable to everybody but uh, I am going to start with some fundamentals so we can start off uh, at a point where um, some of the specialized material would be tractable uh, to those people who are interested in that. Uh, basically this is a very exciting field and uh, digital radiography has come a long way uh, and as you'll see has got a myriad of uh, different applications. Um, so I mean in terms of the objectives of the talk I will start off with some very simple fundamentals. They'll be very intuitive. And uh, then we'll talk about some design considerations of DR systems and some of it uh, may involve knowledge of electronics, but I'll try to explain everything. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the applications of digital radiographic panels in uh, a thing called cone beam CT. And then um, tomosynthesis, which is an exciting new area in mammography. And then we'll talk a little bit about medical image processing and the last one is computer aided uh, assisted diagnosis and 3D visualization. The last one uh, particularly uh, is an area which uh, there is ample opportunity to do uh, a lot of good work in India. So typically a radiographic imaging chain starts with an X-ray source. And then you have a low energy absorbing filter because low energies are basically, they just add to patient dose and they don't add to any uh, image information. So you want to reduce patient dose. So we, people use uh, filters of aluminum typically. And then there's a collimation. And then there's, we'll talk about all these components in a little bit uh, of time. There's a collimating and anti-scatter grid, and then there's a detector. I mean, typically people are used to screen film systems in radiology, which are the traditional systems where you would have a screen, uh, that uh, scintillator that uh, converted X-ray photons to light photons, which then went and exposed film. Uh, digital radiography is a replacement to that, and much more. Now we all know what x-rays are. Basically, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, basically x-rays are somewhere in the 10 raised to minus 10 meter wavelengths. And uh, of course, gamma rays are also there, but we won't talk about them. They're used in nuclear medicine imaging, in gamma cameras, and also in gamma knives in radiation therapy. Now, if you look at uh, production of x-rays, typically you have a cathode, you have a filament where electrons are focused onto an anode to a small spot. Sometimes the spot in mammography can be as small as 100 microns. And then uh, you typically have an anode that's rotating because you don't want it to be heated. And so what happens is you have electrons impinging on the anode and creating x-rays. Typically, only 2% of the energy that uh, impinges on the anode uh, is used to create x-rays. The rest of it um, goes away as heat. It's a very inefficient process. And of course, the anode is also cooled. Typically, there's an oil cooler and there's a bearing. And this whole area of x-ray tubes is a, a specialized area and there are just a few companies in the United States that make uh, very special tubes. And if you take tubes that are used in computed tomography, uh, basically the currents can be as high as uh, 2000 milliamps. But uh, in standard chest x-ray, it's just in the tens or maybe 100 milliamps maximum. Um, so essentially what happens is uh, electrons uh, 
you know, kinetic energy is transferred to the anode as we spoke, and uh, some uh, lots of energy is lost to heat, and some are released as X ray photons. So, different wavelengths of photons would depict different energies. Now, if you look at a typical X ray spectrum, Typically, if you look at continuous, you see a continuous spectrum and sometimes you get what's called a K edge, which is due to the K shell allotrons and that's good because after that, you see an increase in energies. So, this is an X-ray spectrum. This actually is a 25 kV spectrum. This I suspect is a mammography application. And um, so, when we move along, Actually, there are a myriad of different uh, radiological units, some old, some new. And um, if you look at uh, uh, these units, the activities of units are known in Curie's, but then the SI unit uh, of activities in Becquerel's. And then we Rentgen's is exposure, that's basically uh, 10 raised to 2.58 multiplied by 10 raised to minus 4 coulombs per kilogram. That's photons in air. That's what, that, that's the ionization. And then rad is a dose. Basically, uh, what happens is it's, it's, it's a unit of dose. But then if you go down, rem is the unit of human dose because not all X-ray dose, not all energy is absorbed. <coughs> Only some are absorbed. And then uh, sievert is what we use these days. Most of the SI units like gray, sieverts, and becquerels are the ones that are used today. So there's a combination of different units. So if you see uh, people using different units in different countries, it can be quite confusing. Uh, we actually have tables that uh, help us convert. So, now, what happens with interaction with, of X-rays and matter? You know, you, you take some matter here, and then let's call this the input intensity, and this is the output intensity. And what happens is you have photons that are traveling at the speed of light. They impinge on the tissue. Some photons are absorbed and some pass through. It's mostly the photoelectric effect that's important in this situation. So obviously you have less photons coming out of the tissue than went in, than that go in. Otherwise we'd have a perpetual motion machine. And if you look at the ratio of the number of photons coming out to the number that went in, we'd have an idea of tissue attenuation. Talk a little more about that. So essentially, uh, there is a thing that's called a linear attenuation coefficient that is used um, in x-rays. So you have anatomy that removes the photons from the beam. And so you have the interaction, as we talked about the diagnostic x-ray photons with the tissue due to the photoelectric effect. So Attenuation is absorption and also scatter. Some of it is absorbed and some of it is scattered. We'll talk a little more about scatter. So if you look at N, the incident photons, and uh, if the thickness of the attenu attenuating material is T, then essentially the relationship between N sub zero and N is an exponential relationship that is related to the thickness as well as the attenuation coefficient. Well, it's called a linear attenuation coefficient because it was linear in the log domain. Okay, yeah, I know. It's, um, yeah, it's nomenclature because people look at densities, used to look at densities on film. And densities are the log of intensity. So essentially when you looked at film, it looked like linear attenuation and that is the reason for it being called a linear attenuation coefficient? It's a good question. So essentially, if you deconstruct the linear attenuation coefficient, it is a multiplication of the mass attenuation coefficient multiplied by the density. So if you have higher density material, obviously, depending on the mass attenuation coefficient, you'd have a higher linear co coefficient. But if you look at uh, mu sub m for tissue, bone, 
fat and muscle, um, you see different numbers. Okay, so essentially, if you take the Z-effective for bone and soft tissue, that's the nature or the reason for tissue contrast. But many times, you cannot visualize soft anatomy. And uh, so you have to look at different energies. So let's take a look at intuitively what are radiographic images. So differences in tissues causes different in absorption of photons. Let's say a constant number of photons per unit area impinge on tissue. So in one case, you have 1,000 photons in both cases. One case, you get 750. In the other case, you get 250 onto the detector. And let's assume that this is a detector that can count the photons. And so the relative contrast is basically 750 divided by the total number of photons minus 250 divided by the total number of photons, which is 0 0.5. But let's see what happens when there's a little bit of scatter, because this is not like a laser beam. Basically, things get scattered in different dimensions. So essentially, photons that come out of here, some of them go to this part of the detector, and some of this, these photons go to the other detector. Now, if you don't do anything about the scatter, you suddenly lost your contrast. And so what do we do about scatter? So there's a thing called a grid that is placed over here, which actually impedes these uh, photons that are coming at an angle, depending on the shape and size of the grid. And so only the photons that are coming straight through are caught at the detector. But however, we have improved contrast, but we've lost photons. Now, normally, this would not be an issue, but however, as we'll see a little later, um, uh, noise is going to come into picture, and that is going to affect contrast. So let's recap a little bit. And also, you don't want to expose a patient too much unless it's a therapy situation where you selectively expose selective tissue. So exposure is proportional to energy times the number of photons. And dose is proportional to the amount of energy absorbed in tissue. Depending on the radiation type, we can have high exposure and no dose. I mean, you have neutrinos that are going through you all the time, but I mean, there's no dose. So x-rays typically are ionizing radiation, and they do damage tissue uh, in different doses and different energies. So unlimited amounts of ionizing radi radiations, therefore, cannot be applied to the human body. And limiting exposure, obviously, is going to limit the number of photons. So in a noise-free situation, we may not need many photons. However, all physical phenomena are subject to noise. And there are different noise sources. So in the next few slides, let's look at what intuitively we have in terms of noise. So if you have n photons, essentially, Typically, if you take a Poisson process, you get square root of n is the mean square number of what is the mean square of the noise in terms of the photons. So if, let's say I have 100 photons, so I have 100 plus or minus 10 intuitively. And then, so because of this uncertainty, I mean, if you have A or B, in one case, you could have 50 plus or minus 5 photons. In another case, you'd have 55 plus or minus 5 photons. But depending on uh, the nature of the detector, these things, A, may look more contrasty than B, and vice versa under different circumstances. So noise is important in terms of discerning contrast between adjacent objects and pixels. So. What do we do? We increase the number of photons, and suddenly B is darker than A, 
under all conditions of photon noise, assuming that you have a totally noiseless system elsewhere, because you can also have electronic noise. These are, this is what's called quantum limited. We will talk more about it in detail, because as we go past these intuitive concepts, uh, things are going to get a little more mathematical, and uh, I know, uh, you know, I tried to simplify it, uh, but we can't avoid it. So, a radio, what's the purpose of a radiographic detector? So, it's to collect information related to the number of photons on each pixel after X-ray photons pass through a patient or a tissue sample. So, this information generates a radiographic image that can then be displayed and manipulated. Traditional ways of looking at radiographic images were screen film systems where you expose the film with light photons converted from X-ray photons. That's why there's a screen which is a gal typically a gadolinium oxysulfide scintillator that uh, has an efficiency of about 40% or so that converts X-ray photons to light photons. And then these light photons are in contact with film and then you get a radiographic Im image, and that's the screen film system. Today, in uh, many areas, screen film systems uh, are actually uh, being surpassed by uh, digital detectors. Of course, digital detectors are still tend to be quite expensive. So, in digital detectors, ideally, you should be able to count X-ray photons. There are such detectors that do count photons that use photons coming into pressurized gas and then you count the photons, you could look at the peak, peaks of the energies. Uh, but those are not very common these days. I mean, that's still in the research phase and there are a couple of companies that are dealing with these things. And then you have conversion of X-ray photons directly into electronic charge. These are, it's called direct conversion. Actually, it's a little bit, uh, the terminology here is uh, sometimes confusing because people take digital radiography as direct radiography, but digital radiography also has indirect conversion, in which case the photons are converted to light and then to electronic charge. And we will look at the advantages and disadvantages of both of these um, in the next few slides. So everybody knows digital images are 2D array of pixel elements. Now, depending on the radiographic exam, in a chest exam, each of these pixel elements could be about 127 microns to about 200 microns. And that's also true in fluoroscopy. But when you do mammography, you're looking at smaller pixel elements anywhere from 50 to 80 microns or sometimes even 100 microns and we'll, and this is related to the size of the objects that you want to detect because if you look at mammography, you're looking for microcalcifications that could be about 50 microns or so. And as we'll see later that uh, you have to have the appropriate spatial frequencies in order to visualize objects uh, in different exams. So we talked about different conversions. In direct conversions, typically the way was to use a selenium detector. I mean, selenium had been well studied, but this is very pure selenium because selenium was used in xerography uh, as a photoconductor. And uh, that was originally used and it's still used. And uh, we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that to convert X-ray photons to electrons. And then indirect conversion uses intensifying screens to convert X-ray photons to light and then to electrons. Now intensifying screens come in different shapes and sizes. Um, see a typical intensifying screen such as a gadolinium oxysulfide screen in a screen film system also disperses light. So depending on the thickness of the screen, the spread of light. So you would lose spatial resolution. But 
there are newer type of uh, um, intensifying screens or scintillators as we call them that are built in a crystalline way and the most common is cadmium sulfide which is activated by thallium. So it uh, actually converts light at room temperature. So let's look at the basic principles. Typically this is uh, direct radiography where you have a photoconductor and what happens here is when x-ray photons impinge on a photoconductor and typically you have for a 500 micron um, thickness of photoconductor, it's an amorphous photoconductor, you have about 5000 volts across it. And uh, we will talk a little more about that. And so what happens is when x-ray photons hit the phot photoconductor, you get electron and hole pairs. So you collect them on a capacitor, then you have a switch. And very similarly in an intensifying screen, you have an intensifying screen and you have a photo detector which has, with, which has associated with it capacitors. Now this is typically, if you look at the uh, uh, displays that you use, the LCD displays, you select rows and then uh, then you select columns and then you energize the columns. This is the opposite of that. You have rows and you have columns here as well. And we will talk more about it as we go along. So we talked about indirect radiography where you have a scintillator, photo detector, and then you have electronic charge. And let's look at uh, this is a slide from GE. This is an older slide. Actually things have improved. This is a, typically the microstructure of a digital radiography detector. You have a scintillator which is cesium iodide. Then you have an amorphous silicon array. Basically people use amorphous silicon transistors, amorphous silicon photo detectors because these can be laid out relatively inexpensively on glass in large areas. And then you have row and column, you have row selects and column readouts. And then it's typically on a 70 micron glass substrate. This is a very special glass that's made by Corning in upstate New York. And this glass has properties so it doesn't fluoresce with x-rays in the areas of interest because that fluorescence can add to noise. So it's very special glass and it's very, very flat glass. And these are very fragile detectors. If you drop one of these detectors, you have kissed about $65,000 goodbye or more. How large are they? Uh, they can be up to 35 by 43 centimeters or 14 by 17 inches uh, for chest radiography. And some of them come in 43 by 43 centimeters. These are large arrays and each of these detector arrays is very expensive and the people who manufacture them are people in China and some in Korea. The people who manufacture displays are the ones that are contracted to, to make digital radiography panels. So they take half a day off of production and make all the digital radiography panels of one company because it's expensive. And right now, it's small volume, typically. That will change, as we see. And we saw direct radiography where you generate electronic charge directly. Now, this is a cross-section of an amorphous selenium digital radiography panel. And I'm going to spend some time here in terms of um, talking about this. And uh, we can have some questions as well from people who are interested. What happens is, as I said, there's a high voltage power supply. And uh, you have typically 100 volts or so per, no, 10 volts or so for each micron. And so a 500 micron panel has about 5 kV. So there's a high voltage supply that is biasing this particular structure and there's a top electrode and there's a dielectric layer to separate the high voltage. Uh, 
it's like a large capacitor and uh, you have electron hole pairs. The electrons go to the top, they sit there and then the holes come down and they de they're deposited into these capacitors. These capacitors are typically one to two picofarads and uh, we convert the charge in these one to two picofarad capacitors to a resolution of 14 to 16 bits and it's quite a feat when you take 2000 of these things down a column and you're able to do it and so the electronics is quite sophisticated and then these are amorphous silicon thin film transistors actually the on to off ratio of each of these transistors is about 10 raised to 8 the on resistance of each of these transistors is about 2 to 5 mega ohms so so this is typically a amorphous selenium structure and people used to think that this was the best but what happens uh, as uh, in amorphous selenium as is the case with any amorphous material the conduction happens between the valence band and the conduction band so there are states in between and there's what's called hopping conduction where within the band the charge carriers hop from one end to the other and if you look at the mobility of amorphous sil selenium or amorphous silicon it's 1000 times less than that of standard crystalline silicon and then because this is such a large piece of material you have what are called traps and some of them are called deep traps so as the electrons start moving and then there's a thing called the mobility recombination time product you want to make sure that it's large enough that these things don't recombine while they're moving some of these things can go into deep traps and when they go into deep traps not only do they create space charge they also create they just sit there and you can't get them out and in order to get the deep charge deep traps out what is done with some of the amorphous selenium structures is that it's flooded with light but this also causes a phenomenon called ghosting where uh, that means history of the previous image stays with the uh, structure even for the next image depending on how it was exposed and that is a problem for high speed radiography which sometimes you use in fluoroscopy and um, actually today as we will see uh, and I will go over that in a moment cesium iodide with crystalline structures are the preferred way of doing things because that has come a long way now if you look at the collection of charge you have a switching control that selects rows and then you have columns and you have preamplifiers and analog to digital conversion and then it goes into a digital processor and then you have image display and this is an early digital radiography detector this is from a company called ANRAD that in Canada that's owned by Analogic this is one of the early selenium detectors and uh, they use tab bonds to bond all the electronics today the better ways of doing it early, early five years ago you can see this is this is the detector it's huge and so let's look at what happens intuitively in terms of charge collection so think of the uh, pixels as buckets really these are buckets of electrons and so you select the rows okay let's say we selected the row the first row then the each of these rows are connected to the columns then that charge actually comes down and collected in charge amplifiers so essentially this is a common bucket which uh, each time you select rows you could have anywhere from 2000 to 3000 rows and so you have to worry about uh, interaction between each of these pixels and that is why the on to off ratio of the amorphous 
uh, silicon transistors, the TFTs, has to be 10 raised to 8 because you need to maintain about 14 bits to 15 bits of isolation. So this is typically, and we will go over this a little more. I mean, for those of you who are interested in how the electronics is done. Now, if you look at this, this is just an equivalent circuit. So you have a photodiode here, and you have the storage capacitor. And this is the gate line. And uh, this is the integrator. Basically, the other things over here, which we'll talk about, pass the charge amplifier. But typically, what happens is you have a virtual ground here. So what happens is the effects of the column capacitance are negated by the gain of the loop gain of the amplifier. See, column capacitance can be as high as 50 picofarads, which is fairly high. But it does come in in terms of the electronic noise, but you don't want the charge that is in the pixel to be trapped in the column capacitance. So there's an integrating capacitor here that is typically 0.5 to 1 picofarads. And then you have a switch here to ba basically reset it. And uh, then you get a voltage here. And typically, the way it's done is there are ICs which have 128 to 256 charge amplifiers. They cater to 128 to 256 columns. And some of them have A to D converters inside them. And some of them have A to D converters on the outside. So this is highly integrated. And uh, basically, you have a whole bunch of charge amplifiers. And uh, it's a fairly uh, specialized technology. So there are different ways of doing charge amplifiers. And uh, actually, General Electric uses a bunch of delta sigma converters uh, for, uh, for digitization. But prior to each of these, there's a charge amplifier. So we go a little more into details. Now, if you look at this, this is a pixel, and there's a switch. These are some of the traditional panels. And now you notice here that this pixel is not occupying the complete area. You know, you need space for the rows and columns. And you also need space. And this is the second generation version. In the third generation, actually, we put the electronics underneath the pixel. But you still have the second generation panels where this space is taken away. And this is a constant amount of space. So if a pixel is small, a, more percent, a greater percentage of space is taken away. So this is what's called a fill factor. And it affects the efficiency in terms of collection. So now we are coming back to, to our friend scatter. So you have scattering of photons occurs in many places. You have X-ray photons that scatter at the patient. Then you have light photons that can scatter in some scintillators. We talked about the standard scintillators where they could be scattered. So scatter, as we know, causes the contrast of the image to be blurred. And it can be reduced in certain scintillators like CSI that are grown as crystals. So it's almost like they have fibers inside them. So the light goes down a pipe. The high voltage that is applied to photoconductors prevents electrons from scattering. That's one thing it does. That's why photoconductors were originally, before we started seeing problems in terms of deep traps, were uh, things of choice. So this is a... Uh, this is an older slide, and uh, basically, I look at direct imaging and scintillator photodiode arrays to be very similar. But this was generated by a company that was selling selenium photodetectors, and I could come up with a better slide, and therefore, I use this slide. But if you look at, but let's look at the profiles. If the signal profile in screen film systems basically is a little blurred. And in computed radiography, which is another area of early digital and still quite popular techniques and was invented at Kodak in 1975, 
where what happens is instead of a screen film, you have a barium fluorobromide that europium activated as a, as a sensor. So what happens in computer radiography is that electrons that are generated um, in the scintillator due to the x-rays are trapped in metastable states. So then you take a laser and read it point by point. So you take a red laser. So the trapped electrons are sitting between the conduction and the valence band. So they move up to the conduction band and fall down. So there's more energy that comes out. So it generates blue light. And people use photomultipliers to look at this light in terms of um, uh, a point by point scanning. And it's still a $1 billion industry. One of the advantages of computer radiography was that it was truly retrofitable. You take a screen, screen film cassette and take a computer radiography cassette in a standard screen uh, X-ray generator Bucky combination. Bucky, by the way, is um, a term for a screen grid that moves back and forth so that you don't see the grid lines. Then some of the earlier indirect imaging use CCD detectors with scintillation screens. Now, I won't go into details, but it depends on the minification and magnification factors in terms of the optics, where the, model, the optical transfer function convolves with the modulation transfer function of the rest of the system. And uh, you get a signal profile that's this wide. And one of the early companies uh, that actually sold quite a few systems was Swiss Ray. Now today, this is very common. You have a scintillator, which is about a 500 micron scintillator or 150 micron scintillator when it comes to mammography. And then you have a photodiode array. And in direct imaging, you have anywhere from uh, 500 microns to 1,000 micron uh, material of amorphous selenium. It tends to be quite heavy. And uh, these are the different, actually, if you go from the screen film to the cesium iodide, you see a certain, you see an evolution in terms of improvement, in terms of the sharpness of the image, and also the efficiency. So let's look at some other requirements for detectors. In general radiography, you could have detectors greater than 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters. Typically today, the standard is 43 by 43. Or if you want to do chest radiography, it is 43 by 35 centimeters corresponding to 14 by 17 inches. Then mammography, you have 18 centimeters by 24 centimeters. And if you look at the pixel sizes in general radiography, you can go from 100 to 200 microns. In mammography, 60 to 100 microns. And the energy range in general radiography is 30 to 120 keV. The low end usually are used in pediatric exams. And in mammography, it's around 20 keV. OK, in terms of uh, detector properties, you have the coverage of the field, you have geometrical characteristics, and your quantum efficiency, we'll be talking about all these things. You have sensitivity of the detector, you have spatial resolution, you have the noise characteristics, dynamic range, uniformity, okay? Acquisition speed, frame rate. Frame rate is important when you're doing fluoroscopy or dual energy imaging, and cost. I mean, typically, today's detectors are very expensive, but they will come down in the future with different technologies. And uh, we will touch upon those uh, in this workshop. Detector properties, we talked about it. The tiling, which is the size of the tile of the detector. And then the fill factor, which we talked about basically how much of the detector is basically looking at X-ray photons and how much of it is being used for extraneous things, necessary but extraneous, such as uh, the electronics, the thin film transistors. This is tiling. Basically, um, I mean, it shows a rectangular uh, 
tile, but usually it's a square tile. Then if you look at an object, a detector pixel element will always distort the object. And it's going to be a transformed object. Actually, it convolves with the transfer function of this. And so you will typically get an object that is slightly larger than the object that you're looking at, depending on what the transformation characteristics are. Fill factor is what we talked about. This is the active detector area. And this is the area that is there for the electronics and also the lines that you have in terms of rows and columns. Then spatial resolution, you have things called outside the system factors, which the effective size of the focal spot. Now if your focal spot is fairly large, you cannot do any better than your focal spot because there's already a transfer function there that blurs the image. And that's why you try to use smaller spots for exams like mammography. Magnification, when you magnify things, the spot also gets magnified. And then relative motion, I mean, unless you're imaging a cadaver or a dead body, I mean, there's always motion. In mammography, of course, people have uh, compression plates where the object to be imaged is held constantly, but that's not true in imaging and so typically what one, is do, what one does in terms of X-ray imaging is you try to use a small pulse of X-ray with a higher current. So it's like a shutter in a camera. Well, they could be anywhere from 8.3 milliseconds wide to about um, anywhere to a second, depending on the exam. Now, if it was in an extremity like a hand where you can hold it fairly steady, uh, the exposure is talked about in milliamps multiplied by seconds. So you have MAS, whereas in CT scanning, where you're going very fast, you use very small pulses, but you use very high currents, like about two amps. So now in terms of uh, detector characteristics, you have the aperture size of the detector, you have spatial sampling and signal spreading effects. Aperture is the active portion of the detector element. So it also determines the spatial frequency response. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And we'll talk about a lot in a few moments. And the sampling interval, we'll talk about spatial sampling. You have a Nyquist frequency and aliasing will occur. Let's talk about intuitive sampling and aliasing. Let's say you have two objects here. One has got an intensity of plus one and another has an intensity of minus one. And the detector element is twice as large as this. So you get a zero. I mean, that's essentially a Nyquist in terms of spatial sampling. Whereas, and the same thing happens if you have plus one and minus one, whereas if you have an element and a pixel element that are compatible, this plus one gets transformed to plus one. So, yeah. Does radiation behave like light? Well, radiation does behave like light before it strikes uh, any object. But after that, it scatters. Of course, it's like light scattering too. No, it is not possible to focus it. People have tried focusing. There are very specialized ways of focusing it. People have used very thin capillaries of material. There was a Russian patent on that. And actually, um, some people in University of Syracuse were doing it. But it was for such small doses. The focusing part of it takes away a lot of energy. So it makes it very, very inefficient. So it cannot be focused like light. It can be, uh, unfortunately. So what we do is we convert it to light and then, if necessary, focus the light. It's what is done in CCD type of detectors. Now, usually, if you look at some of the detect, have I answered your question? Yeah. 
Our people have done that. Actually, it's done in multiple, uh, uh, in uh, um, multiple energy imaging. So some of the energies pass through the sensor on top and some of them pass through the sensor on bottom. And so different energies of the spectra are used to image the patient. What happens is contrast is also energy dependent. It's also dependent on the spectra. So that's, those are some of the things that are done. But what happens in typically digital radiography detectors, it's expensive enough to make one array on glass. And in future, actually, to answer your question, people are looking at putting amorphous silicon on plastic. University of Waterloo in Canada, they are doing a lot of work. What happens is when you deposit amorphous silicon uh, on glass, people had a 250 degrees Celsius process. And that could not be used for plastic because it would melt the plastic. But today there are low temperature processes that go at 150 degrees Celsius on polyamide uh, substrates that are going to come uh, into the picture a few years from now. And there's some work that's going on in every place. And uh, because of uh, the confidential nature of this work, you don't hear about it unless it's within a particular company. Now, uh, essentially, if you look at uh, distribution of interacting quanta, you t it typically follows a POSOP statistics. And I've showed a reference there. So you have sigma as n sub zero, which is the mean of number of X-ray quanta fall falling on a detector of a given area. And, uh, and then you have the probability of success. Basically, is this a useful quantum or not? So if you have G as the mean gain, then the signal can be described as n sub zero multiplied by uh, G multiplied by the probability of success and the variance is given uh, in terms of an extra term in parentheses that is gamma square plus sigma square. And you can look it up actually in the reference. We'll not go into details here, but these, these are derivations that have been done by Harry Barrett and Swindle many years ago. So what you, what you need to do is you need to incorporate all the sources that contribute to the noise of the signal. And if you, if you look at independent statistics, so the noise will add as the square of the sum of the squares. So, you know, the sum of the square noise is the sum of the squares. And then you have to consider the spatial frequency dependence of the signal and the, no and the noise in order to completely defi define the noise because the noise is also frequency dependent. Okay, noise is usually dis uh, described as a noise power spectrum or the Wiener spectrum. And the signal, we have a thing called a modulation transfer function. A lot of these terms have been borrowed from optics. And then we have to correct for nonlinearities. And then typically we try to use DQE as a function of frequency, which is related to the signal to noise ratio out as a function of frequency. So what is this DQE? Detective quantum efficiency is the signal to is the ratio of the signal to noise ratio square of the output of a system divided by the signal to noise ratio square of the input of the system. 